a brand new week, a brand new top 10. Welcome on into the channel. For those of you who are new here, my name is Cole Thompson. I'm a radio show host based in Houston, and I talk college football every single day. I talk NFL, I talk MLB, I talk NHL, I talk NBA, but I love talking college football. And if this is the type of content you enjoy, this is the channel made for you. So subscribe down below, leave a comment telling me who you think is the top team going into week 10. Tell your friends, your family, your pastor, everybody around you, and even the drunk dude inside of a Waffle House parking lot on Saturdays about this channel. Because if we get to 1,000 subscribers by November 15th, I will shave my head live on air, Lex Luthor style. Three live shows a week starting on Tuesday, Thursdays, and Fridays, 30 to 45 minutes. We talk college football. We talk NFL. And if you like that type of content, make sure you hit subscribe. And let's continue to talk college football. Week 9, filled with promise and potential from a lot of good teams. And also a couple of bye weeks. A few upsets along the way. And some scares. But... At the end of the day, these are the top 10 teams going into week 10. Real fast, give out my honorable mentions. First up, LSU. Didn't play this week. I love the offense of what you have with the combination of Malik Neighbors catching balls from Jaden Daniels. They're starting to run the football extremely well. And defensively, you do have elite playmakers. Now, the problem is I want to see Matt House's unit play more complimentary. But once they start doing that, they still are in the running to represent the SEC West in Atlanta. They got a big game this weekend coming up against Alabama on the road in Bryant-Denny Stadium. Going to be a must-see showdown. Next up, Air Force. Crazy to say this, but yes, Air Force does deserve its flowers. Look at this team and how they've played so far this season. They're physical when it comes to running the football. They do an exceptional job blocking up front and opening up as many running lanes as possible. They're a nitty-gritty ground and pound team. And Troy Calhoun actually has done something pretty impressive this year, which I don't think a lot of people are paying attention to. Air Force leads the country in yards per pass attempt at 18.8. They barely throw the football 32 times on the season. But when they do sling it, they're not afraid to go yard. They got a massive win, 30-13 to 13 over Colorado State. They're just outside looking in for me this week. Next up, Missouri. By week, but by the standard of what we're saying, this is a Missouri team that means business and could do damage if they get on the right track early against Georgia. I love the way that defense is playing. I love the way they're able to run the football primarily inside the red zone. Brady Cook is having a breakout season. You have one of the best and more underrated combination of wide receivers in the NF in college football, and Theo Wees Jr. and Luther Burden. This team having an extra week to prepare for Georgia might do wonders for when they take on the Bulldogs, top-ranked Bulldogs in the AP poll for the 20th consecutive week. And last but certainly not least for me this week, I'm going to go ahead and give the nod to Penn State. Penn State is a top-10 defense in college football, and they play like a top-10 team defensively. But this was a game against Indiana, a very lowly Indiana roster that should have just been able to dismantle, take apart this team. And instead, you really had a sluggish performance defensively. That's the problem. You can go ahead and say that Drew Aller going for 210 yards and having an interception is bad, but you won 33 to 24. That's 24 points scored. You didn't allow Ohio State to score 24 points against you. And you allow Indiana that sits at two and six to do that. It's hard for me to give you a nod this week. Now, you're still good enough to, I think, make it to the Big Ten Championship. And at the end of the day, if you win that, you're going to the CFP. But as of this moment, it's still challenging to say that that type of performance is going to hold up against a Michigan, especially against a Michigan in two weeks when you play host to them in Happy Valley. All right, now on to the actual top 10. Number 10 this week, Oklahoma. I'm tired of hearing this narrative. Oklahoma lost the game on, Oklahoma lost the game. They didn't find a way to win. And they lost to a lowly Kansas team. Let's just go ahead and end the narrative here. Kansas is very good at what they do. Kansas is well-prepared every single week. And that's a testament to Lance Leipold and how he's constructed his roster, got the buy-in from the players. You do realize that Kansas is bowl eligible Back-to-back -back years for the first time since 2007-2008. That's saying something. Lance Leipold is building a culture in Lawrence, one that could be sustainable and actually turn the Jayhawks into a football program, not just a football team that resides in the likes 
of a football university. But really, really good game execution by the Jayhawks, 38-33 win. What I thought was impressive in this game, though, was you were able to see the rushing attack of Oklahoma come on strong. They had, I think it was like 269 rushing yards, five touchdowns on the ground. Gavin Schwashwick had a rushing score. Tawe Walker averaged like 6.3 yards per play. And Dylan Gabriel played hero ball. I mean, plain and simple. The reason you even stood a shot of coming away and remaining undefeated was because Dylan Gabriel gave you that element. And so far, he's basically been that guy all season long. And this was one of those games where you need your defense to step up. You're allowed now to have concerns, I think, about this Oklahoma defense because it's one thing to have you come back against the Texas. And that's another thing to have you come back against a UCF and need a two-point field conversion to secure the dub. It's another thing to lose to a backup quarterback in Jason Bean, who probably would be a Power 5 starter elsewhere at this point, but mainly due to the fact that your defense couldn't stop the run. Kansas averaged roughly about 5.5 yards per play. It was nearly a first down. They had four rushing touchdowns on the day. You got two interceptions. So I think that when you compare this team versus an Oklahoma, I mean a Penn State team, they get the slight nod, but there's reason for self-doubt. There is no longer room for error in Oklahoma if you're trying to make it to Arlington in year two underneath Brett Venables. Definitely a game that you want to remember, but not always for the positive reasons. Number nine, I'm going to go with the surprise. Give me Ole Miss. Ole Miss actually is playing meaningful football. And the only reason why they're not higher is I have a standard. I say every single week, if you lose to the opponent ahead of you, they stay ahead. But this version of Ole Miss that has turned the corner since losing to Alabama is really starting to hit its stride at the right time. And I don't know if they'll be able to beat up on Georgia, but they get a massive win over Vanderbilt in the Khaki Bowl, the greatest rivalry in the SEC. We all can admit that, right, people? But Jackson Dart, once again, has another solid day. He completes over 68% of his throws. Quinshawn Junkins on the ground rushes for over 120 yards. He finds the end zone. But defensively, you guys realize you have to give your flowers out to what we've seen so far from Pete Golding since week four. This is a team that now has five turnovers in their last three games, if I'm not mistaken. They had five sacks on the day, seven tackles for losses. They are corralling quarterbacks into making mistakes. They held Ken Seals and I'm blanking on the other guy's name off the top of my head to eight completions and under 68 passing yards. This is the third time this year also that Ole Miss has allowed fewer than 300 total yards of offense to an opponent in back-to-back weeks. They've done that. They are now looking like a legitimate threat to make noise in the SEC. They certainly, in my opinion, are the third place team in the SEC I'm going to be very intrigued to see what happens moving forward because they have big games ahead. And if they can find a way to win out against Texas A&M, against Georgia, against Mississippi State, and then Louisiana Monroe to close out the year, not only will they have a good shot of representing the West in Atlanta, especially if LSU gets the win, but they also may be a dark horse to watch for in the college football playoff race. Speaking of which, Alabama comes in at number eight for me this week. By week, again, we know what this Alabama team is. They got a lot of potential. This is not the best roster that Nick Saban has ever produced. But when you have the GOAT running the show, you're never going to count him out. And they now can basically secure their spot in Atlanta with a win over LSU. Nothing is promised. Nothing is promised. You still got to beat Auburn in the Iron Bowl, which is going to be tough, especially because the game's in Jordan Hare. But this is more so a clear-cut pathway for you to dominate and claim your spot as still the team to beat in the SEC West moving forward. Big-time game, big-time buy, came at the right time. Let's see how they play against a very solid LSU team offensively. Number seven, Texas. Look at that. Another team got the win over an opponent. They stay ahead. The Longhorns won 35-6 over BYU. Good game. Very good game. But I think what you have to realize is Malik Murphy still has his struggles. This was not a perfect performance from him whatsoever. But you don't really need a perfect performance from a guy like Malik Murphy in this first game. What you needed was chemistry, continuity, and balance. And I think you got all of those elements on display. You started off with a big 74-yard punt return by Xavier Worthy. That truly set the tone. You rushed the ball extremely well, 5.3 yards per play. Jonathan Brooks had another big touchdown run. Jaden Blue found the end zone. He averaged 11 yards per play. 
And then you saw Murphy, when he was on his P's and Q's, actually producing like a quarterback that many people wanted to see compete with Quinn Ewers for the starting job this spring. You saw the deep ball. You watched him be able to methodically move the sticks and keep drives alive. And defensively, it was another strong performance from the Longhorns at home. That's what you're really banking on. Everyone else stepping up around you when you don't have your starting quarterback. Quinn Ewers plays in this game. You still probably win and cover the spread. But it is nice to see that there wasn't a drop-off in terms of demeanor and chemistry when watching long the Longhorns play on Saturday. This was a mass, massive win in terms of culture standpoint, but they got a big game ahead. A huge test against Kansas State. Kansas State shut out Houston 41 0 and everyone knows what happened with Texas Longhorns last week. They basically needed a really risky, maybe you could even say wrong call by the referees to secure the 31-24 dub. Okay, we're not going to go any further. Six this week, uh, Oregon. Oregon might have the most impressive win of the season. Now, I don't know if I can justifiably say that when you look at Penn State's defense, which, again, crapped the bed, and then you look at Washington and how they've played, which – is not really a compliment in their last two games, but Utah defensively comes in with an aura and a demeanor of we mean business, we're always well prepared, good luck catching us slipping, whether we're playing at home or away. It didn't matter that the game was in Rice Cycle Stadium. This was just a beatdown bully performance of chemistry and of persistence from the Ducks. Dan Lanning. And this Oregon team has drastically looked completely different in their last two games since losing to Washington. And that's saying something about the future of this team because of now we're talking about how the Pac-12 could have a representative or they could be left out of the CFP altogether. As good as Washington is playing offensively, you could say that in a neutral site location, Oregon is the more profitable team. They have another dominant day by Bo Nix. He gets two touchdowns, doesn't really have you know, the elite standard, what, what you're looking for in terms of 400 passing yards, but still he's completing over 75% of his throws, not to mention he rushed for another game. Uh, this was a team that averaged 5.3 yards per play on the ground. And defensively, they got after Bryson Barnes, two big interceptions. They held the passing attack to 147 yards. And again, you're watching the way that Dan Lanning is coaching. It's very similar to what you see in Kirby Smart and Nick Saban. And that's not coincidence either. He coached underneath both those guys. He took a few lessons and chapters out of their book and put it in his own. And look at what's happening now in Eugene. This is a dangerous, dangerous version of what you're seeing for the Ducks. They could absolutely win a national title if they keep on pace. Number five, I'm still riding high on Washington. So they're not at number five this week. I'm going to just hold out hope and pray that the Huskies keep, don't prove me wrong. Florida State comes in for me at number five. This was, again, a full-fledged performance offensively of what you want to see from the Seminoles. Because talent-wise, I think maybe there's two teams that are better in that category than Florida State. Outside of that, there's really not much else you can say. Florida State has a great quarterback in Jordan Travis who had a phenomenal day through the year with three touchdowns. Trey Benson is a very good ball mover chain type running back who continues to pick up the yards at the right time. He averaged like, I think, 5.5 yards per play, had two touchdowns on the day, if I'm not mistaken, led the team into receiving yards, which is really crazy. Keon Coleman is a human highlight reel. It literally should just be copy, paste, insert next team here, uh, next week here, because that's what he does. And defensively, they did get after Wake Forest. Now, good news was you were playing against a Wake Forest team starting a freshman quarterback, but that's not really the case here. You were able to hold this team to under 100 passing yards, and you only allowed 2.6 yards per play after contact on the ground. This version of Florida State, four quarters of meaningful football where they don't take their foot off the gas, that's a team that can win a national title. Absolutely, they belong in the garneration of praise and accolades this week. Number four, Washington. Okay, Washington plain and simple. What the hell are you guys doing? Like this was Michael Penix's game. And I don't mean that in a positive. I mean that in a, why is Michael Penix against a Stanford team having to bail you out? And he wasn't perfect by any means. There were multiple overthrows. There was the first play of scrimmage where he throws the interception and they call a uh, pass interference. So they get the ball back. He had some mental errors, but this team, defensively in back-to-back -back weeks now 
either has allowed opponents of lesser tier to hang around or get the lead. And then you're wondering, is this the moment where it all comes crashing down? Because we can talk about how bad of a loss it was for Oklahoma. But Oklahoma played against a bowl-eligible version of Kansas. We can't say the same thing about Washington. Arizona State is likely not going bowling this year. You can say the exact same thing about Stanford. They're going through roster changes and coaching personnel moves, and they're trying to find their stride at the right moment, especially at quarterback. And they nearly lose back-to-back -back weeks. It's a complete 180. Like, the momentum that was sucked out of Oregon in Seattle, basically left with them in Seattle, and then they've now gone super sand, and Washington is kind of holding on to its laurels of just being able to say we have one of the better wins in college football. But still, you win. I'm holding out hope. They had a big test ahead this week against USC, which really doesn't seem that big anymore. But if you allow that passing attack to go ham, I mean, it may be dead in the water for you and Kalen DeBoer. Number three, Michigan. Uh, there's really not much I have to say on this one. Michigan didn't have to play this week. They're dealing with their own off-the-field issues, not to mention, you know, they're stealing more signs than the Hamburglers stealing cheeseburgers. But we're not going to get into that. They still, in my opinion, have the best chance to go undefeated. And if so, they're going to the college football playoff. Two, Ohio State. I moved Ohio State down this week only because of the dominance of what we're going to talk about with the next team. But they found a way to win on the road. They got the rushing attack somewhat back. That was a huge plus, in my opinion, getting a Travion Henderson fully healthy. They still didn't have a Mecca Abuka, which is doing wonders of what you say. Okay, why are we not able to go and figure things out as quickly as possible? Kyle McCord, two interceptions, but one of them really wasn't on him. You did a good job defensively. I think that's the main takeaway I have here. You forced Braden Locke into feeling the pressure on multiple instances and a lot of outs, a lot of third downs. I mean, you got to look at this team. They were only 6-16 on third down conversions, and they were 0-2 on fourth down attempts, which credit to Luke Fickle for going hard. But this defense, once again, proving time and time, they are – a legit threat and somebody you do not want to mess around with because if, if so, guess what? You're getting the hammer. And Jim Knowles deserves a lot of praise for what he's done this season, especially with a veteran roster. Now you get back a run game, you get back a Mecca Abuka, it's going to be mayhem in the big house of Michigan come November 25th. We all can agree with that one. But number one this week for me, without question, has got to be Georgia. Georgia time and time again, has shown you their cards. And all of us are idiots for falling for it because Georgia never starts off the season super strong. They have one great performance, and then it's like idle, 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 slowly building up momentum. And then right at the end of October before November starts, good God, watch out. They did so. That's just it. And I thought that Florida offensively showed a lot of hype and a lot of heart. But it doesn't matter. When your offense can't do anything in the first half to where you see how quickly Georgia just jumps out to a 43-20 to 20 win and they just physically outwork you, 486 total yards, 50% on third down, fourth down conversion, one time, 23 first downs, that's saying something. And Carson Beck had arguably his best game since joining the staff. That, that's a quarterback that deserves a lot of praise and is not getting enough national attention for whatever reason. Beck's been playing well. He basically took the time to learn everything he saw under these sets invented and then hyperactively built that inside him to when his moment arrived, he was like, no, 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 no. I'm the dude. You don't want to mess around with me. So credit to him on that one. Deshaun Edwards, run of the football. Great game. Two rushing scores. You also had Kendall Milton score a touchdown. Every receiver stepped up. Every single one in place of Brock Bowers. Lad McConkey, look at that. Cross the middle of the field just like Brock, 22.5 yards per play. Dominic Lovett, uh, 20 yards per catch, four catches, 83 yards. Oscar Delp, Dylan Bell, both play of uh, influential roles inside the red zone. Rara Thomas, 19-yard grab. And defensively, again, you basically eliminated the rushing attack. Montreal Johnson finished with 82 yards. Trevor Etienne finished with 42 yards. Graham Mertz had negative 32 yards on the day. He did rush for a score, but really at that point, the game was out of reach. This version of Georgia's offense, combined with what Glenn Schumann does defensively, 
that's a team that you do not want to play in November because they now are no longer trying just to show the world, hey, we are still the best team in college football. They now are methodically going to throw you to the wayside if they get the chance to because they want to prove to themselves, damn, look at where we are, look at how far we've come, and look how much we're not slowing down. So Georgia this week has got to be number ten, uh, number one on the list. There you have it. My top ten this week, ten, Oklahoma, nine, Ole Miss, eight, Alabama, seven, Texas, six, Oregon, five, Florida State, four, Washington, three, Michigan, two, Ohio State, and number one, like they are in the AP poll, is the Georgia Bulldogs, and I'm not sure that's changing anytime soon. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching that video. Don't hit the X button yet. Make sure you hit subscribe to keep up with all of our daily content found on Just Saying It and anything else that we post on this channel. Bye.